The LoopRing project is an Ethereum Layer 2 scaling protocol that aims to significantly reduce congestion on the Ethereum blockchain. In this video, we'll take a deeper look at LoopRing and consider its merits as both a blockchain project and a cryptocurrency investment. Hi guys, my name is AG Hunter and my goal is to help you make good investment decisions by providing quality analysis of cryptocurrency projects. If you like what you see in this video, please hit like and subscribe. My YouTube channel is still very new, so every engagement really helps. Also, if you have any feedback or suggestions, please leave a comment below and I will get back to you. In this video, we are going to explore the LoopRing project. There is a lot to unpack here, so I'm going to break my analysis into several separate videos. In this video, we'll look at the history of the project, including a discussion of the limitations of the Ethereum blockchain to handle or large volumes of transactions. We'll then look at Loopring's solution to this problem and explain how they are able to use technology to solve the scaling problem. In a second video, I'll look at how Loopring compares to some of the other projects working on the same problems, and I'll go into detail about the products the team are building off the back of their technology. Before I begin, I need to make the standard disclaimer that I am not a financial advisor. All investments are inherently risky, and you should do your own research before making any investment decisions. So what is Loopring? As I mentioned in my introduction, Loopring is a layer two scaling solution for the Ethereum network. While this is certainly a true statement, it also significantly undersells what the Loopring team is building. You might ask how scaling Ethereum could possibly be undersold, but I think if you focus purely on the subject of scaling, you don't really appreciate everything that is going on with this project. When you talk scaling, you also tend to get sent down a rabbit hole filled with terms like ZK rollups, optimistic rollups, and Merkle trees, which can be intimidating and difficult to navigate if you aren't immersed in cryptography and computer programming every day. These terms are important and we'll deal with them in our own way, but they don't capture everything that Loopring is as a business. If you have watched any of my videos, you will know that I believe that you can have all the fancy mathematics that you want, but if no one wants to buy your products, then you'll fail as a project. So your business case is important. What I want to do in this video is give you a holistic view of the project, starting with its background and how it evolved into the project we see today. We'll cover things like roll-ups and zero knowledge proofs, and I'll attempt to do this in a way that is easier for someone who is not a computer programmer to understand. I think it's important to do this because Loopring as a project is very different to some of the other projects I've recently reviewed. In the case of a project like TrustSwap or Origin Trail, the underlying technology is important, but the business case is in many ways more important. Another way to say this is that what the technology does is more important than how the technology works. In the case of Loopring, however, a large part of the business case is the tech. There are many competitors and each is trying to solve the same problem in a different way. The devil is in the detail and the detail is in the tech. So we'll talk tech for a bit. Then once we understand the tech, in a second video, I'll go into more detail about what Loopring is doing and what products it's bringing to market. This will also include a more traditional analysis of things such as who is the team behind the project, the project's tokenomics, and some other metrics we can use to compare it to its competitors. By the end of the two videos, you should have a good understanding of the Ethereum scaling problem, some of the proposed solutions to this problem, and most importantly, the Loopring project itself. I will be honest and say that the research for this project was heavy. While I will cover the topics I have just indicated, what I am not going to do is a deep dive on either cryptography or the Ethereum blockchain. I want to keep this discussion as light as possible as my intention is to make this information accessible to the layperson. While I do have an engineering degree and this included some solid maths and also a bit of programming, I'm not a mathematician or a programmer. What follows is simply my best efforts to explain some pretty heavy concepts. I'm also going to assume that if you're watching this video, you already understand a little bit about the Ethereum network and blockchains in general. So we'll start by looking at the history of the Loopring project. The project started out in 2017 as an open source protocol for building decentralized exchanges. The founders of the Loopring project felt that the centralized exchanges that dominated crypto markets at the time were not in keeping with the decentralized philosophy of the crypto community. They set out to develop a solution that provided the functionality of a centralized exchange without the risks that come with having to store your assets on the exchange's central servers or surrender your private keys. As the project developed, it quickly became apparent that it was not possible to provide a traditional exchange-like experience on the Ethereum blockchain due to the inability of Ethereum to process the volume of transactions required. Ethereum gas costs also potentially made this style of trading prohibitively expensive on the Layer 1 Ethereum network. The challenge for the Ethereum project team then became how to scale the Ethereum project such that transaction throughput could be increased and cost per transaction could be reduced. The result is the Loopring project that we see in 2020. So how does Loopring propose to achieve these two objectives? The way that the Loopring team has chosen is what's known as a ZK rollup. This statement immediately raises two questions. What is a rollup and what does ZK mean? I'll start with the concept of a rollup and then move on to the ZK bit. As part of this, we'll also touch on something called an optimistic rollup, which is an alternative technology that is being developed by other projects in the Ethereum ecosystem. A rollup is conceptually quite easy to understand. It's simply a collection of transactions. 
If you consider a traditional cryptocurrency exchange where people are buying and selling many different tokens, the exchange could be processing many transactions every second. The entire Ethereum blockchain is only able to process 12 to 15 transactions per second, so one busy exchange could easily chew up the entire network's computational power. One way around this is to try and move some transactions off chain and this is what a rollup does. Rather than print each individual transaction to the main chain, a large number of transactions are completed off chain and then bundled together, rolled up to use the terminology. When a large enough bundle of transactions has been rolled up together, then a single transaction is sent to the Ethereum blockchain to confirm that all of the other transactions have been completed. How this is done, I'll get to shortly, but what's important here is that instead of thousands of transactions, you are now only writing one transaction to the blockchain, and this transaction represents all the thousands of transactions that have been bundled into your rollup. And the cost of that one transaction is spread across the thousands of transactions in the rollup. So instead of paying $30 per transaction, as been the case lately, you might now be paying a cent or two in transaction fees. Where do these transactions take place if they are not on the main chain? The strictly correct answer in the case of Loopring is that they take place in a Merkle tree that is part of the Loopring protocol. Conceptually, you could envision this as a side chain, although strictly speaking, I'm not sure if a side chain is the correct term. What's important though is that by using a rollup, you have taken thousands of transactions off the main chain, bundled them all together, and then printed a single transaction back to the main chain to confirm that all of the other transactions have occurred. You have rolled up several thousand transactions into one. How does a rollup achieve this? There are two types of rollups you'll hear talked about in Ethereum scaling conversations. The one being used by Loopring is known as a ZK rollup, and the other is an optimistic rollup which is being worked on by some other projects in the Ethereum ecosystem. In addition to physically compressing the size of the transactions, rollups also need to prove to the blockchain that the information they are printing is true. If I'm taking 4,000 individual transactions and compressing them into one blockchain transaction, then I need to be able to prove to you that the transaction that I am giving to you is a true representation of the 4,000 off-chain transactions that took place. ZK rollups and optimistic rollups do this in different ways. The ZK in ZK rollups stands for zero knowledge and is a reference to a zero knowledge proof, which is a mathematical method that ZK rollups use to prove validity. ZK proofs are nothing new and have been around in cryptography for about 40 years. In its most basic terms, a zero knowledge proof allows me to prove something to you without having to show you the details of how I proved it. A proof in this sense means a mathematical calculation, so for a ZK proof, I only need to show you the outcome of that calculation, not the calculation itself, for you to know that the calculation was done correctly. Originally, ZK proofs were used by projects like Zcash as a privacy tool. In the case of Loopring, however, the concept is used for a different reason. If you think about our exchange example, a zero-knowledge proof allows me to prove to you mathematically that those 4,000 transactions took place without having to show you each of the 4,000 individual transactions. Because the proof is mathematically sound, you only need to be satisfied that the proof was performed correctly to be satisfied that the proof is a true representation of the underlying transactions. A more correct definition of this is that a ZK proof is what's called a succinct proof, meaning that the proof is shorter than the thing that it is trying to prove. So I might only need 40 lines of code to prove that 4,000 lines of code representing our transactions actually took place. Finally, and very importantly, because a ZK proof is a mathematical proof, if you have a valid proof, then you know with certainty that the things the proof relates to took place. In this case, those things are the transactions in the rollup. So the proof validates that the information in the rollup is correct. You don't need to trust any other party or entity, you just need to trust the math. This is very important when it comes to comparing ZK rollups to optimistic rollups. To summarize, a ZK proof is a mathematical calculation that allows us to prove something without needing to show you all of our calculations. And by definition, the proof that we obtain is smaller than the thing that we are trying to validate. The proof also validates that the transactions represented by the the roll-up are a correct representation of the transactions that took place. The proof is the evidence we need to be confident that the information we have been provided is correct. The other type of rollup being implemented is known as an optimistic rollup. The concept of the rollup in this situation is the same in that it bundles up a bunch of transactions into one single transaction that for the sake of this discussion we'll call the person doing the rollup an aggregator. Optimistic rollups use a different mechanism to establish the validity of the transactions however. In an optimistic rollup there is no proof provided at the time the transactions are written to the block that the rollup is legitimate. They are called optimistic because they assume that the rollup is valid without explicitly checking it. To put it in layman's terms when a new rollup is written to the block, we just assume that it's all good and we move on. This has some significant advantages as we'll soon see. The optimistic rollup is then validated after the fact by what are known as watches. The aggregator rolls up a bunch of transactions and writes them to the block without having to prove the validity of what they are submitting. After the transaction has been confirmed, watches then check to make sure it's accurate. 
If it is found that a fraudulent transaction has been submitted by an aggregator, then the watcher submits what's called a fraud proof to prove this. If it's proven that the aggravator submitted a fraudulent transaction, they are slashed, which is like being fined. In this system, aggravators are incentivized to do the right thing for fear of being slashed if they are caught doing something fraudulent, and watchers are incentivized to check the transactions by the chance to earn fees that are slashed from the aggregator if they catch a fraudulent transaction. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of the two approaches? The one that gets the most discussion currently is that ZK rollups can only be used for payments and exchanges, whereas optimistic rollups provide full smart contract capability. To put it another way, there are things you can do on Ethereum that you can't do via a ZK rollup. This poses the question of why we would use ZK rollups at all. There are a couple of reasons, but most importantly for loopring, ZK rollups are much quicker to establish the validity of the rollup. With a ZK, you know as soon as it is printed to the main chain that the transactions it contains are valid. With an optimistic rollup, it takes an amount of time for the watchers to do their proofs and validate each block. One estimate I read said this could be up to several hours. So optimistic rollups have much more computational flexibility, but this flexibility comes with costs, and one of those costs is time. If you are trying to do a simple transaction like making a payment or exchanging a token on an exchange, you don't want to have to wait four or five hours for the transaction to be confirmed. ZK rollups are limited in the types of transactions they can process, but for simple transactions, they are much faster to establish validity. This is what makes them ideal for exchanges and payment related transactions. So that concludes our discussion of the principle underlying Looprings technology. There are a couple of things that I need to note here. First is that the description I've gone through is very simplistic and I've glossed over a lot of detail. The intention is to give you an understanding of the broad concepts without diving into the weeds with too much information. I've linked a few references in the comments below that provide a lot more detail on some of the issues I've discussed. Secondly, what I've covered is my understanding of the situation in September 2020. This may change in the future. I know that Loopring is looking to enhance the functionality of its ZK rollup protocol to handle more complex transactions and I suspect that developers working with optimistic rollups are also trying to increase the flexibility of these protocols as well. In my next video, I'll extend on what we've discussed today to look at how Loopring is using its technology to bring products to the marketplace, and we'll also check out some of Loopring's competitors and see how some of the projects in this space compare to one another. If you like what you saw today, you might like to check out one of my other videos, which you can see linked on screen. Also, if you have any comments or feedback, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comment section below. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe before you leave.